Welcome back to The Narrative. Ernest Hillier is on with me. He is the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Investment and Tourism in St. Lucia. We're talking citizenship by investment. Welcome back. Another yeah, thing, and another thing that, that, that was raised in my interview with, uh, with opposition leader Shastini is that under, because the developers are out there seeking business in order to recoup their investment in your capital projects, that you're bypassing due diligence in some instances. No, that's a very serious charge. And I questioned the veracity of that, um, eh, both in my mind that it didn't seem to make a lot of sense. Explain that to me. How, how, I mean, how, I, how, I is, a due I, I how is a due diligence done, given the arrangement you have with the developers who are seeking funding for some of your capital development? How does, how does the process work? Is it the same as a private sector developer, a developer seeking um, citizenship by investment for pri private development? I mean, to, just like you, I'm bewildered by this statement. It, it is preposterous. But let me explain the process to you and try to make sense of, of what he said. When an applicant, say, for example, you are applying for citizenship to St. Lucia and you are going to donate, um, the, make the donation of 100000 for the housing project. So you are by, you know, you're donating to the housing project. And so 100000 When you apply to St. Lucia, you will only pay, listen to me carefully, you will only pay your processing fee and your due diligence fee. It goes to the bank. In St. Lucia, the first instance of due diligence is that the bank does due diligence on you. And the bank has to establish whether or not there are any concerns with your monies that you have transferred. That's the first step. Then when you are cleared, we will then send your file to do due diligence. The next stage is when it comes back and you are cleared, you still are not approved yet. It then goes to intelligence and law enforcement review for clearance. When you pass the third stage, so you pass the banking review, the due diligence in the go to the field and examine who you are, they check all your documents, and then you pass law enforcement and intelligence review. Only then the unit will make a recommendation to the board that this person has cleared all three stages and that person should be approved. You will then be informed and said, you have passed all three stages. Can you now make your donation of 100000 which you will then do. It still has to clear the bank. And when it clears the bank, we will then issue you citizenship. Now explain to me in a process like this, how is it that you are approving people without they make going to through their diligence. I, I don't, even if for some reason, law enforcement doesn't do it. There is the due diligence firms we hire. And what if they don't do it? There is still the banks that are autonomous, independent entities that do due diligence. We have three stages. So explain to me, how can he conceive of, a, of an approval that has not gone through due diligence? I, I don't see how it is possible. And sometimes in St. Lucia, we are criticized for being the slowest and we take too long to give approvals. But we believe we should go through all the stages and make sure that we subject applicants to a rigorous examination. Mm. I, I mean, certainly if, if, if it's happening, then it's one of the most dangerous things to be happening, particularly because of the concerns about bad actors in the world and uh, the terrorists precisely, um, flying precisely. under the flag of passports from... Uh, Grenada or St. Lucia or Dominica, um, that would certainly be a very dangerous thing and put the, cit the citizens, Precisely. The, the, the citizens of birth uh, in, in the region at, at, at serious risk and disadvantage. So one would hope that uh, the, the opposition leader got it wrong. Um, well, I, I think he gets many things wrong, but anyway. <laughs> no, um... Let's talk a little bit about how well your program is doing right now. Uh, you say 8% of your GDP. Um, are, you, are you... No, not GDP. Income. Income. Oh, of your, of your revenue. Um, so how, 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 in money terms, how, how, what, what was your, for instance, your 2023 figure? Our 2023 figure, I think the Prime Minister announced it in the estimates, um, just over 100 million EC. 
would have been transferred from the CIP unit to central government. So there are three ways in which monies are transferred. <clears throat> Persons who um, make the, the donation, so it goes to the National Economic Fund, and government can draw down on that fund. It goes through CIP bonds. We have a bond offering. We're the only island with a bond offering where persons buy bonds at 0% interest. So there is a bond offering and there is the operating surpluses from the unit itself. And the, the unit has surpluses that it generates from the different fees that it charges. So between the three sources, the drawdowns from the National Economic Fund, the CIP bonds, and the um, operating surplus um, it totaled over 100 million dollars our total revenue was about 1.2 billion dollars um, so it was just under 10 percent um, of, of St. Lucia's revenue in some of the other islands it's as high as 50 percent and others um, slightly less um, but the point is it is still quite very significant the new option that we we offering will allow developers to raise money in agreement with government to implement certain projects for us up front, spend their money up front, and then have to recoup it through offering citizenships. Hmm. But, but they are not out there operating independently in terms of approvals and, and, and simply just you know, sending, no, a, a, list, no, sending no, a list no. of names to your unit to say no, we've sir. approved those people. Ah. Absolutely. Absolutely not. I mean, that, that's the point. Every single application is to the unit. Every single application is to the unit. The unit processes it. And I gave you the, the, the process for um, a, approval. And then the board, it goes to the board and the board approves it. And then certificates are sent to the minister to sign for citizenship. No developer approves. No developer um, grants citizenship at all. And in none of the islands, to, to be honest, I'm speaking on behalf of St. Lucia, but I, I, I think it's also important to know that in none of the uh, other islands would such happen. And all the countries I know, all the islands I know, take extreme care and caution to make sure that due diligence is followed. At least I'm satisfied that all of us are committed to ensuring that the due diligence processes are, are, are rigid, especially in recent times. But still, given, I mean, the, the programs are of a tremendous economic value to the territories. I know here in Grenada it is as well. But um, the people of the, of the region, uh, and, and in Grenada, I can speak for Grenada, uh, are concerned about, the, the you know, when, when you still talk about selling passports, I know we are trying to, re our unit here in Grenada is trying to rebrand so that we don't talk about selling passports. Yes. Um, because it's got that stigma on it, and it's not a program that is totally and widely accepted by the, or the, 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 the legacy citizens of the region. Um, how, how, do you, how do you change that? How do you fix that? Because from time to time, you see stories out there of criminals uh, traveling on, on, on a Dominica passport or a Grenada passport or you know, some other island and being involved in some sort of illegal act. And people are concerned about that. Now, it is very interesting that you've raised this point and let me share a story with you when we started in 2015 2016 we were very clear in our minds in st lucia we did not want a program that was a transactional program we disapprove of the notion of selling passports we disapprove of it we said we wanted an interactional program where every new citizen had to be able to build a connection with st lucia had to know what was going on into St. Lucia, would be inviting our new citizens to come to St. Lucia to live, to invest, um, to own property, and be part of the economic development of the country. And we coined the phrase, beyond the passport, in 2015 into 2016. Because in our view, again, we did not want to be seen as selling passports. We wanted to be seen as securing investments through citizenship. That's how we wanted the program to be seen and to be branded. Of course, when the government changed in 2021 and the leader of the opposition became prime minister, he stopped it. We had even employed what we call a citizen relationship officer whose job at the unit was specifically, once you are approved as a citizen, to send out a dossier to you, to say to you, 
this is St. Lucia, the history of St. Lucia. These are all our activities, all our festivals come to St. Lucia. These are all investment opportunities and for them to try and build a relationship with the new citizens. It is why, for example, we had a quota of only 500 applications per year because we were not interested in sell as what they call sell passports as many as possible, as quickly as possible. We did not want that. And you are absolutely right. That approach has developed a negative perception of the programs. So what can be a very valuable mechanism to raise financing for national development through real estate or for donation has been tarnished by people out there saying that we are selling passports. For me, it is a question of how we are using the citizenship like as that is done, like was done in many European countries, in, in the United States, in Canada, to raise financing for, for development. And we, I, I reject the notion that we should um, position this industry as selling passports. We are raising investment through the offering of citizenships. And you are right, the average person will feel offended if they believe the government is just out there selling passports willy-nilly. And, that, that and, and, and people, be. you know, you know, there are people who have never been to Grenada, never been to Grenada, probably would mix us up with Jamaica, who are traveling around the world, uh, enjoying visa free access with a Grenada passport. And people find that, you know, people find that offensive, um, you know, and, and governments say, oh, well, we're not selling passports. But from where the, where the ordinary citizen stands, um, that is just what it looks like. Because that is all these people want. Um, they do not live in the country. I know in Grenada, we have a unique situation where our E2 visa, one of only two countries in the world, enjoying that, that facility with, with the United States. But now the United States has set a condition that you must be resident for two years in, the, in, in your economic country in order to even pursue the E2, um, that you have to live here. But other than that... Um, you're not obligated to, to live or to know the country or to have anything to do with the country to be able to enjoy citizenship. Well, I, I mean, I can understand again why some persons would be very concerned about this. Mm -hmm. It is now a feature of modern society um, for especially highly mobile persons to want to have more than one citizenship for, for a variety of reasons. Some people want to have it for security. You see, we in the Caribbean, we've gotten accustomed to a democratic way of life and enjoying all the pleasures of, of, of life. We, we, we live to enjoy life. But, you know, think about some of the, the other countries in the world where there are stateless individuals, persons who don't have an avenue for getting a passport for them to travel for, for whatever reason, whether it's in the Middle East, whether it's certain African countries, where you just don't have the facility if you want to leave your country or travel for you to get a, 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 um, travel documents. And for some persons, having that second citizenship is the avenue for them. There are some people where their citizenship is a threat depending on where they go in the world. And they want to have the, the second citizenship that they can use, you know, um, if they are traveling certain parts of the world. Can I tell you, we, we have quite a few applications from United States, from Americans, who want to have second citizenships because they want, when they travel in certain parts of the world, they don't use their American passports. There are people who are frightened about wars that may take place in their region and they want to have second citizenship in case and a place to move to in case um, the, the, the security situation deteriorates extensively. So there are multiple reasons why individuals want second citizenships. You, you, your government had the opportunity to make changes and to bring the program back up to the standard that yeah. you wanted as far as uh, checks and balances are concerned. You said the opposition leader made some changes. Um, why haven't you, you've had ample time, why have you not fixed what you thought he broke? Well, that's an excellent question, really good question. And in fact... Um, I'm delivering the address tomorrow at the Immigration Forum, and these are some of the issues that I want to deal with. Excellent. When the changes were made by the then Prime Minister, the leader of the opposition, he, he claimed that rightfully or wrongfully, that it was necessary to bring Central in line with the other countries. So they felt the program, as we, we structured it, um, was too rigorous too rigid, and that it should be in line. That's why our 200,000 minimum fee was reduced to 100,000. 
why the quota of 500 was removed, why the net worth of the applicant of 3 million was removed, why the publication of the list of persons who were accepted and rejected had to be published was removed. All those things were removed. And non-payment of commissions, which is another issue today, we won't have time to talk about that, um, were removed. To bring it in line, the industry has moved on in the last ten, um, nine years. When we came back, our first objective was to um, ensure that due diligence processes were firmly in place. The number of due diligence officers from three to about 15. We increased the verification officers from about two to about eight to make sure we strengthen the due diligence processes and ensure that we can say to everybody that we are satisfied we have the most rigorous due diligence process. But for us now to start making all those changes on our own will make us highly uncompetitive. It has to be done at a collaborative level, which is why we support the regional coordinated approach. We support it. Uh, but for us to go back to where we were, everybody will have to go there. Otherwise, we become uncompetitive and we become, you know, least desirable because we would be too regulated compared to the others. So we have an interest in having an MOA. We have an interest in it. We have an interest in a coordinated regional approach. Trust me, we have a deep interest in it. So we cannot go back to that on our own. So we want to go back to it with everybody else. But you... you, so you, 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 you you cannot go back to the 200,000 because you have contractual arrangements with developers. Exactly. exactly but the 200, exactly. everybody else has signed on to have a, a, a minimum of 200. That's, That's fine. That's fine. And, and, I, and I keep telling you, we wanted a clause that says it will apply to us once those contracts are satisfied. And we still, that's our mindset. Let me tell you. We want the regional and coordinated approach. We have standards and provisions we want to ask everybody to adopt to make the programs even more regulated. But at this point, if we should just this, make those changes, if we had known this was going to come, we probably would not have signed the contracts a couple months ago, two, three months ago. All right. Well, Deputy Prime Minister Ernest Hillier, thank you so much for joining me on The Narrative. It was a pleasure to have you for the first time on The Narrative, and I look forward to having you back often. Thank you. I'm always available if you want to speak, and hello to all my Grenadian friends. This is The Narrative. I'm your storyteller, Calistro Farrier, Ernest Hillier, Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Tourism in St. Lucia, addressing the Citizenship by Investment Program in his country. More when we come back.